All right, we're in Revelation chapter 17. There was a question asked last week about the woman riding the beast. So I thought about it, and uh, that's what we'll speak about uh, tonight. Um, there are one or two sections in the book of Revelations where, um, uh, you know, it might require further um, explanation, and this is one of those sections. Um, so we're looking at chapter 17 tonight. Um, and we'll look at it in its entirety, but we'll just read um, the first five verses and then we'll make reference to the other verses as we go along. Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit to, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet covered, colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a great cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of a fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Right, well, we'll stop reading there. Um, I, I think that as we come to this particular chapter, it's, it will be a good thing for us just to have a bit of an understanding as to what the Bible says uh, elsewhere concerning um, what leads up to this particular situation. Um, the, the Bible gives us a bit of an insight into organized religion, and you'll be surprised that organized religion finds its way, finds itself at its, uh, find its beginning way back in the book of Genesis, even in chapter 11. And in Genesis chapter 11, there you have the, the Tower of Babel. And that particular tower, it was, it was a, a tower built so that essentially men could worship the heavens, not necessarily to try and gain access into heaven. Uh, they wouldn't be able to build something as tall as that, or that would be an impossibility. But it was built with the idea that they would uh, be able to worship the heavens. And you read in chapter 10 and chapter 11 of Genesis of an individual by the name of Nimrod. And the name Nimrod means rebel. And Nimrod was indeed a rebel against everything that was good and that was holy. Now, secular history tells us that he uh, had married a woman, and her name, I'm going to, I was going over a few times today trying to get the pronunciation correct, and so I'll try, uh, but it's Sir Miramis, Sir, Mar Sir Miramis, so I'll say it one time. And uh, that was his wife. Now, there's a bit of um, controversy or different views as to just exactly who she was some thought some view that she, he had actually married his mother and uh, he uh, and there was a supernatural birth of a child there's another view which is probably more likely i can see your frown face i'm not mm -hmm. saying this view but i'm just saying this is what a lot of people think is that uh, this particular woman sir miramis sir, Mir sir miramis uh, that she had married nimrod and she fell pregnant, and uh, Nimrod wasn't the father, and he uh, was furious at this, as you would imagine, and she claimed that she fell pregnant through a, a beam of light, and so she claims a supernatural aspect to this child that was about to be born. Anyway, she uh, used this particular scheme to, to essentially to establish a new religion and this new religion was one where she would be the queen of heaven and she would have this young little supernatural child if you, if you think about it it's a, it's a distortion and a perversion of what the bible teaches in genesis chapter 3 and verse verse 15 where it talks about you know a seed that would come and so this particular woman with this particular child was the the starting ground if you like for a number of religions that had gone into the world and you find it in egypt you find it in greece and you find it in rome now in egypt the the name of the woman is isis and the son is horus and in greek 
The name of the woman was Epaphrodite. The name of the son was Cupid. And in Rome, the name of the woman is the Madonna. And the child is the Christ child. But it's not the same Christ that you and I worship. So you find the, the starts of this religion way back in the book of Genesis chapter 11. And essentially, the, the religion of um, the people in Genesis chapter 11 was one of humanism. And humanism is quite a prevalent religion today. They won't say it's a religion, but it's a system of belief. And uh, it's quite prevalent. And of course, humanism says that we can make ourselves better. You're going to be like your own God, if you like. And so what we read of in Genesis chapter 17, we see this is kind of, you know, coming down through the ages. We can trace it way back to Genesis 11, where um, this false religion, which dominated the whole earth, uh, began. Now, you'll remember that last week we had an overview of the judgments that would come down upon the uh, people and upon the earth during the time of the tribulation period. And we saw that the last judgment, the last vial or bowl that was poured out upon the earth resulted in great earthquakes and the topography of the landscape was just brought kind of level. And the view that we have is that all of the great structures, all of the great buildings, everything essentially that man had made and said, look how good and look how great we are, was leveled down to the ground. And so in Revelation chapter 16, we read in verse 19 that the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon. Now, when you think of Babylon, you think of Babel, don't you? We automatically think, because it's saying it's the same philosophy, that great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, when we think of Babylon, there, there was an actual place called ba Babylon. Uh, the, at one time, it was one of the, the seven wonders of the world. Uh, when Saddam Hussein was in power, now, obviously, Babylon had been leveled to the ground. When Saddam Hussein was in power, one of the things that he wanted to do was to rebuild Babylon. And ba Babylon is found at about 100 or so miles outside of Baghdad. And so his desire was to rebuild Babylon and well he didn't you know Babylon is still in ruins I think it's for the for the most part still unexcavated so it's highly unlikely that Babylon the actual place the actual city that that is going to be rebuilt so when you think of Babylon you think about a particular place but what I want you to notice tonight to try and understand chapter 17 that Babylon isn't necessarily a city or a place but it's a system that it's been that's been spoken of so it's, it's highly unlikely that babylon even though it's in ruins now it's highly unlikely that babylon would ever be rebuilt who would want to rebuild that place so there's no reason for it to be rebuilt so if we think in terms of rather that babylon is a system and babylon represents everything that man has accomplished outside of god <coughs> kind of like the tower of babel it represented man's efforts of self-worship as it sought to worship the heavens. So we read of Babylon in chapter 17, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of a geographical location, rather we need to be thinking in terms of a system. Okay, so I hope that kind of understand, uh, gives you some understanding because I just wanted to give you a little bit of a backdrop as we look into this situation and this uh, scene before us where we have a woman that is portrayed as a harlot that is riding the beast. So we're going to look at three things about this. So the first thing that we want to consider is we want to identify just who this woman is. So in verse 1, the Bible says that, uh, it says, uh, Come hither, in the latter part of the verse, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now what John is speaking about here, he's talking about a one world religion and this one world religion is a religion that is going to be established during the tribulation period now when you think about the word whore or the name whore it's not a word that we are necessarily comfortable in using in 
in, in our company. But, you know, this is a Bible word that's been used. It's a very descriptive word. And so we, we shouldn't think, uh, be uncomfortable in using it. We know that it refers to a, a woman that is selling her body. It's someone who's a, a prostitute or another Bible name would be a harlot. But the, the term whore in, in this chapter here has the idea of a, it's used as a metaphor, as a false religion where people are involved in a false and apostate religion. Now in the Bible, there are a number of cities that are described as being cities of whoredom. Nineveh was one of those cities, Tyre was another city, and of course Jerusalem, because Jerusalem had turned its back upon God and had gone essentially committing spiritual adultery with false gods. But Babylon is called the Great Hall, and in verse 5 it's spoken of as being the mother of harlots. So when you think of all the different nations and cities that have committed spiritual adultery, that have gone off and committed wickedness against God, Babylon is the mother of them all, is the leader of them all. So the woman refers to Babylon. It's a one world religion. So if you can understand that, then the rest of the chapter really does begin to make sense. Babylon or the woman, is referred to as a one-world religion. And then we see in verse 1 that this woman, this great whore, she sitteth upon many waters. Now we can read and say, what on earth does that mean? But I'll just draw your attention down to verse 15. And one of the things in the book of Revelation is that oftentimes the, the chapter will explain what it's talking about just later on, if you just go ahead and read. But verse 15 says, that the waters, so that makes reference to the, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters in verse 1. The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, the, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the waters are talking about the peoples that are upon the world. So you can see that it's talking about a religious system. It's talking about a one world religious system. Now, if you think at the moment, I, I don't know if we could actually count how many different types of religions <coughs> there are in the world today. There must be hundreds and thousands of different religions, and then within a religion, different offshoots and branches. There, there's just too many for us to definitively be able to count. But you can say there are some religions that are kind of uh, dominant in the world today. So you could say, well, there's Christianity, then there would be Judaism, There'd be Hinduism, Islam would be another, um, humanism would be quite a big one nowadays. So you could say there's five or six really main, uh, re Buddhism would be another main religion. So, you know, there's five or six main religions in the world today. But in the tribulation period, there will be one main religion. And so this is what chapter 17 is talking about, a worldwide religion in other words everybody in the world is going to be you know submitting to and obeying the teachings of, of this particular religion and we might think about this and say well this sounds crazy because you know you couldn't get two baptist churches to get together and agree about most things so how are you going to get all the different religions in the world to come together and agree well somehow the the antichrist and the false prophet together are going to concoct a plan so that he's going to get people to be able to agree and to come under the umbrella of one major religion. And so you can imagine that it's going to be a religion that essentially is going to appeal to everybody. Everybody wins in this type of religion, but there, it will be one dominant religion that everybody is adhering to. And even today, it seems like the devil is kind of preempting things because there is a push towards that. Because people would like for us to have everything together, where, where churches would just be churches together and do things together in the community. But that, of course, would mean, you know, our church getting involved with the Methodist Church and get involved with the Roman Catholic Church and get involved with all the different churches. And, and sometimes these churches together can just, you know, reach out to, you know, people that don't even claim the name of Christ. In the one world religion that people are pushing towards today, 
They don't mind. They can get a person who's a Jew, and someone who's an Islam, someone who's a, uh, a Roman Catholic priest. You know, they all take part in, in a particular service. And everybody says, isn't this wonderful? But everybody is, you know, there, there are people that are trying to move us towards this direction where there's a one world religion. But of course, in order to do that, people have to drop their doctrinal differences. Otherwise, we cannot. How can two walk together unless they agree? So they have to drop a whole bunch of things. But true Christianity, really, because I, say, I mentioned Christianity as being one of the major religions, but under Christianity, there is a, a, there's a lot of different religions that would fall under Christianity. So, for instance, you would have uh, Roman Catholicism. Most people, when they think of Christianity, think of a Roman Catholic. Or a person who is a Mormon but might say, well, we like Christians. Jehovah Witnesses would like to be under the banner of Christianity. So Christianity as a whole, or Christendom as a whole, you know, isn't really what, uh, isn't really talking about true faith. I, I think a true Christian, someone who's been born again, isn't going to be part of what's happening in the world today, and most definitely won't be what happens, uh, won't have a part with what's going to happen during the tribulation period. When, when Christ comes and he takes the church to be with himself, the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ, and we which are alive remain uh, courted together with him in the clouds. When we take it away, and this will goes into great tribulation, there will be a, a form of Christianity upon the earth. There will be a brand of Christianity upon the earth, but it will deny the power of, thereof. And of course, there will be religion. Religion will be rife during the tribulation period as well. Verse 2 of chapter 17 says, uh, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So verse 2 talks about the fact that the entire world is going to come under the spell of this great end-time religion. Everybody is going to be involved with this uh, um, end-time religion. The kings of the earth, well that would talk about those that are in the highest power. It could be the leaders of the world, prime ministers, and presidents. They'll be a part of this one world religion. The Bible says that they're going to commit fornication and so you might say, well how is this going to be? Well it talks about their interaction with uh, Babylon. But not only will rulers be seduced by Babylon, we know that in ordinary people will, because it goes on to say that the, the inhabitants of the earth, so in other words ordinary, you know, the man in the street type of situation, they will be involved and part of this one world religion. And all of the nations of the earth will be drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, they're going to believe and they're going to drink heavily all that Babylon, the false religion, is going to teach. Now when you think about this uh, one world religion, what kind, what, of all the different kinds of religions that are in the world today, what would be the one that you think would most likely fit the bill of this particular kind of religion that we're speaking of in chapter 17? Islam? Islam? Anyone else? Congregation. Congregational? Buddhism. Protestantism? Atheism. Not Sorry? Atheism. Buddhism. Atheism. Atheism? Atheism. Atheism. <laughs> no, no, you're all wrong. <laughs> Well, I, I say that lightly because we don't really know, but, but the, the one that comes to the figure more than any other, to me, would be the Roman Catholic Church. Now, a lot of people may not like to think that because you think, well, this is part of Christianity, but they're not part of true Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church don't have a, a system of belief like you and I do. When they talk of salvation, they're not talking of, of what we and you and I talk of when you think about salvation. Now, I'm not saying to you tonight that the that the, the, the woman that rides a beast or this religious system that's going to be in the world in the tribulation period is Roman Catholicism per se but I believe it's going to be heavily influenced by Roman Catholicism you know that even today there is a huge move of evangelical churches to go back to Rome so most people would say that we're Protestant we're actually not Protestant we were never part of Rome Baptist churches were never part of Rome, uh, but the, even amongst Protestant churches, they are kind of going back to Rome, and they fawn over the, the Pope, they kiss his ring, you know, they, you know, they look upon him as a great spiritual leader, and would you believe that even prominent Baptist ministers 
speak of their Roman Catholic friends and are doing, you know, they're kind of fawn over the Roman Catholics and particularly over the Pope. So there's a huge move towards uh, going back to Rome today. But I think that as we think about this particular, as we consider the identity of this woman, you'd have to say that it is organized religion. My personal opinion is that it's going to be for the most part Roman Catholicism that is going to embrace all the other different religions that are in the world. It's not going to be Roman Catholicism in its purest form, but it's going to be, that's going to be the, um, the tenor, if you like. The fact that you, do you notice the clothes, the clothes that are, are spoken of as the harlot wearing? Now, in, those, in, 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 in the time of, of John writing this, it wasn't uncommon for a, a harlot or a, or a prostitute to wear certain clothing so that people could identify her as being a prostitute. But now, in, in, from a spiritual perspective, we read as to how the, the, the woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet, and in decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. The, the Roman Catholic Church has all of that uh, and in abundance. So when we, we think about the, um, the harlot of Revelation 17, I don't want to say specifically that it is the Roman Catholic Church, but I think it's going to play heavily in the fact that this is going to be a worldwide organized religion. Okay, so we understand the identity of the woman, the identity of the harlot, it's talking about a religious world system. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing I like you to notice is that uh, the control of the woman. Now, what might be a little bit misunderstanding, cause a bit of misunderstanding for you and I, is that you read that the woman is riding this beast, and you would almost think that the woman is controlling the beast. But the fact of the matter is, is that the picture that is portrayed for us is not so much as the woman controlling the beast, but rather that the woman is being supported by the beast. Okay, so the beast, of course, is talking about the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is, of course, going to be the world ruler. And, of course, the false prophet, his job in the tribulation period is essentially to direct worship towards the Antichrist, that he is, as far as they're concerned, God in their midst. So the woman is a system, it's a religious worldwide system, and the beast, of course, is talking about uh, the Antichrist. We read that the beast is full of names of blasphemy, and so this reminds us that the Antichrist is going to set himself up as God to be worshipped as God. One of the verses we saw last week was 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, where the Bible says, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. Now the man of sin is the Antichrist. There are a number of names that the Antichrist has, but man of sin is one of those names where he's going to be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing that himself that he is God. So essentially, the Antichrist is going to want the worship that the world is willing to give. So the beast is supporting the worldwide religion. He's going to give the religion essentially its power. And then in verse 9, uh, we see that uh, this, there are seven he uh, let's just have a look here. Uh, look at verse 8. Uh, the beast that is sourced was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are um, seven mountains on which the um, seven, upon which the woman sitteth. Um, so the the beast, of course, any animal that's got seven heads is a bit of a scary animal to have to deal with. But verse nine tells us that the seven heads of this beast are seven mountains, uh, and so. The seven 
mountains or the, or the seven hills of the, of the beast, <coughs> that could have reference to um, the fact that Ro Rome is the only country, well, I, I, I beg to, I, 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 let me just re-say that. <coughs> Rome is one of the countries that is built upon seven hills. I think there are some countries in, in Southern America that, that could have this kind of a claim, where there's a, uh, a city that has seven hills uh, as part of its topography. But Rome, we know, is built upon seven hills. So it could have reference to the fact that it's talking about Rome, or it could also have reference to the uh, seven continents of the world uh, as well. If it's on the seven hills, talking about that of Rome, then it does certainly link towards Roman Catholicism. But as I said earlier, um, it does lend itself, these verses, to cause us to consider that it has to do with Roman Catholicism as being the, the head. And if you consider it as like an umbrella, where it causes all the different religions to worship under it. So the beast is the Antichrist. The woman is the one world religion. And the Antichrist is seen as supporting, she's riding the beast, so the Antichrist is seen as supporting her. And he gives the woman the power because essentially he wants to receive worship during the tribulation period. And then in verse 10, it speaks about, uh, let's see, it says there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short time. So the, the seven kings are talking about seven kingdoms. So five kingdoms had already existed. So the kingdoms would be the Egyptian kingdom, or a worldwide power, if you like, um, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and the empires, the Rome, that was in John's day. And he was looking upon the Antichrist who would, uh, who would rise up out of the ashes of Rome uh, and he would be the, um, uh, the the next kingdom as well. And then in verse eleven, the um, so I, I beg your pardon. Let me just say that again. The, e e Egypt was one kingdom. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Persians, mm -hmm. and then Greece. I forgot to mention Greece. So that's five. And then the sixth kingdom was the one that was r ruling then, which was Rome. And the seventh kingdom would be the kingdom of the Antichrist, which would, of course, come out of a revived Roman Empire. And then verse 11, it speaks about the reign of the Antichrist. Um, so th this is a strange verse because it says, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. So that's a, that does seem a little bit strange, but what it's talking about is that the beast is the seventh as well, as the eighth king. Now you might say, well, how can he be the seventh king and the eighth king? Well, it's, the indication is that we have in this chapter is that the, the beast, the Antichrist, is going to receive a wound and he's going to die or appear to die and he's going to be resurrected or appear to be resurrected. So he'll be the seventh king, then he will be resurrected and he'll become the eighth king. So that's why it says he's of the seventh and he's the eighth. And then it tells us that his rule is going to be a defined and designated and short-lived rule, where it talks about he's going to continue for just but a, a short space of time. And verse 12 and 13 talks about uh, ten horns or ten kings. And this will be talking about very likely a, the way that the Antichrist is going to divide up the, the, the world in the tribulation period is going to be in regions. And each of the kings will have a particular region that they're going to rule over. But they're going to give the Antichrist the power. So everything that they do is going to be in support of the Antichrist. So they'll be kind of like regents in certain areas. And it says they're going to rule with him for one hour. So it also talks for just but a, a short period of time. So we have the identity of the woman. The identity of the woman is a worldwide religion. The control of the woman is the Antichrist. And the third thing I want you to draw to your attention is the destruction of the woman. And we see this in verse 16 through to verse 18. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, 
and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Remember the ten horns, so speaking about the ten kings that are going to be ruling under the Antichrist, right? For God has put in their heart to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So this one world religion that we speak of, this woman that's riding the beast, this uh, mother of harlots, this, this uh, woman that is a one world religious system, is ultimately doomed for destruction. Now we saw that the woman rides the beast. The beast is supporting the woman, ultimately so that he can get worship that, is, that, that he wants from the world. But there's going to come a time when the, the religious role of the system is going to run its course and the ten kings that are going to be ruling under the Antichrist and the Antichrist are going to turn mm -hmm. upon the woman, organized religion, and utterly destroy it. So she just exists for a particular purpose and for a particular period in time. And it's when she has run her course when her usefulness has been used up, then the Antichrist is going to destroy that one world religion. The fact of the matter is, and this is a strange thing, well, not strange, but a good thing, is how that God, he determines that the woman or worldwide religion is going to be destroyed. And God puts it in the hearts of these ten kings and in the heart of the Antichrist to turn upon the woman. God gets his enemies to deal with this false worship and religious system. And so that's the, the end of the harlot, this one world system. It's all ultimately going to come to naught. And it will have served its purpose because when the Antichrist deals with the one world religion, he will set himself up to be the one ultimately that is to be worshipped. He is the God. He is the focus of all that live upon the earth. And religion will have no place at that time. <coughs> so chapter 17 deals with religious Babylon. Babylon is not a place. It is a system. It's a system of belief. Just, we're not going to deal with this because we're going to stop in a few moments. But in chapter 18, it deals with political or financial Babylon. And so all the, the, the great financial centers of this world is also going to be brought to nothing as well. Remember, this is coming towards the end of the tribulation period and everything is going to be brought down uh, to its knees. So the world is going to lose its worship system that it created and the world will lose its wealth system that it lusts after as well, as we see in chapter 18. So to close with tonight, it's difficult to close on a high when you think, how can, I, how can we be encouraged by this? Well, I'm encouraged by a couple of things. So firstly, I'm encouraged by the fact that I know that we're not going to go through the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. I know that we're going to be taken away, we're going to be raptured, we'll be with our Lord when all of these things take place. But having said that, I know that there is a move to try and get people towards a, a one belief system, to, for there to be an interfaith or a one world religion. And so, amongst churches where there's an ecumenicalism, where they just say, let's all get together, it doesn't matter what we believe, just as long as we love one another. We, as a church that stands upon the Word of God as being our only authority, we have to resist that. And we cannot work together with someone if we don't agree with that, with that person believes. So it's important that you and I make a strong stand upon the Word of God. It's not that we want nothing to do with everyone else in the world and it's just us here at Bible Baptist Church in Berry and we're happy just being together. I'm quite happy with fellowship and with other people. But they've got to believe exactly like we believe. The Word of God must be their sole authority and they must practice what the Bible says do. Otherwise, we really can't have much to do with them. So we, we are not going to go through the tribulation period, but you can certainly see a move. You can see a direction that this world is where it wants people to be more ecumenical, where it wants us to have all things together. But you and I need to be a people that will stand strongly upon the Word of God. And even if it meant that we were the only church in this region that was standing upon the Word of God, well, so be it. 
we want to make sure that we remain faithful to what the Word of God teaches. But I know that there are still 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, and there are many churches in our country that are still uh, preaching the same gospel, believing the same message, using the same Bible, and we're thankful for them. And we stand with them, and we fellowship with them. For those who would turn their backs upon the Word of God, and turn their back upon those precious truths that we hold there, while well, we have to say, well, we can't have fellowship with you. We want to stand upon the Word of God. All right, so we'll stop there tonight. So I hope that helps you to understand who the woman is and who the beast is, and we see uh, ultimately her end as well. May God bless you.